I am Jennifer Cahill, and I am so excited to bring to you these two evolutionary leaders who first connected many, many years ago. They've read one another's books, studied one another's research, Dr. Deepak Chopra and Dr. Bruce Lipton, together again for the first time in many, many years, discussing their latest takes on science and spirituality. Bruce H. Lipton, PhD, is a cellular biologist and lecturer and is internationally recognized as a leader in bridging science and spirit. Bruce was on the faculty of the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and later performed groundbreaking research related to stem cells at Stanford University. He is the best-selling author of The Biology of Belief, as well as The Honeymoon Effect, and co-author with Steve Behrman of Spontaneous Evolution. Bruce received the 2009 Goy Peace Award, extremely prestigious in Japan, in honor of his scientific contribution to the world in harmony. For more information, you can go to brucelipton.com. Additionally, we have here with us today, Dr. Deepak Chopra. He is the founder of the Chopra Foundation, a nonprofit entity focused on research for well-being and humanitarianism, as well as Chopra Global, a modern day health company at the intersection of science and spirituality. He is a world renowned pioneer in integrative medicine and personal transformation. Chopra is a clinical medicine and public health uh, professor as well at the University of California, San Diego, and serves as a senior scientist at the Gallup Poll. Additionally, Dr. Chopra has written over 91 books, including his most recent books, Total Meditation and MetaHuman. Thank you so much for being here with us for this very special reuniting of these two brilliant minds. Hello, and thank you so much for being here with us. I'm Jennifer K. Hill, and this is a very special day that we have here today. We have Dr. Bruce Lipton here with us today, joining us from New Zealand, as well as Dr. Deepak Chopra. And we are in for quite the ride. I wish that we could just play the pre-conversation we were all having to kind of, as a you know, precursor to the show, we were having such a fun, uh, fun conversation offline. And uh, today we invited Bruce to join us as part of the series that we've been doing because he is one of the foremost experts in the world, as well as a pioneer, just like Deepak, in the world of science and spirituality. So Bruce, as our esteemed guest, there are a lot of directions we could go. You are the grandfather of epigenetics, among many other things. And I think perhaps since the show deals with science and spirituality, Perhaps today we could talk about consciousness and begin by discussing what is the consciousness of the cell, Bruce? And let's talk to our audience about how we can learn to harness that consciousness of our cells. Well, it's a, a very interesting topic and, and I really want to appreciate uh, my hero over there, Deepak, who brought us together years ago in Evolutionary Leaders. Uh, and he invited me in the beginning and I felt so honored. and. Uh, together over the years, we really have been going through this uh, evolution process that the planet is facing. And the idea about consciousness is simply this, is that most of us have been programmed with a belief in genetics, genetic control, that the character of my life, first it was a physical character, and then they started to recognize, oh, behavior oh, and emotions are being uh, uh, controlled by the genes. And I go, so when I was teaching that, and I said, well, what was I actually teaching to the individual? Uh, and what I was teaching was this, as far as we know, we didn't pick the genes we came with. And uh, if you don't like the traits you have, you just can't change the genes. And then we add that genes turn on and off by themselves. And I go, what does that leave us with? And I say, it leaves us with a belief of being victims of our heredity victims. And I said, what do you mean? Well, you had no control over this and the genes could turn on and off and give you cancer as you're walking down the street and you have no control. Uh, and when people feel they're victims, they give up power because they say, well, if I can't control this, I'm going to find somebody who can control it. And therefore we give up control of our health uh, to the medical arena, which is, you know, most people growing up when it came a health issue, you go to the doctor and at some point in a child's life, you, you, there's a pattern that says when it's a health issue, we're not the professional, but the doctor is a professional and we give them power 
uh, of their words over our life. Okay, mm -hmm. so I was teaching that kind of stuff. And then uh, I was involved with stem cell research. And just to uh, indicate what the heck is a stem cell. And if you're out there watching this show, don't worry, you're full of stem cells, because if you don't have stem cells, you would be dead by now. And I go, what, what do they represent? I say a human body is not a single entity. It's, it's made out of 50 trillion cellular citizens. Uh, and almost every cell has every function that a human has, digestion, respiration, mobility, reproduction, even a cell has immune system. So I said, there's not anything new in this body, but we're made out of 50 trillion cells. And now comes the important part is that every second, millions of cells are dying every second. And I go, so at the end of the day, hundreds of billions of cells are, are gone. I go, oh my God, well, how many days can you live if you're losing hundreds of billions of cells every day? And I go, not very long, but stem cells are in your body. They're embryonic cells. And these embryonic cells replace anything that has died during the, the day. I go, okay. I cloned a stem cell, which is I put one stem cell in a Petri dish by itself and it divides every 10 or 12 hours. So first there's one and two and then four and then eight and doubling 30,000 cells in the Petri dish one week later. And I take these 30,000, I split them 10,000 each into three different Petri dishes. And I go, okay, uh, I have these embryonic cells, three dishes, genetically identical cells, but I change the environment that the cells live in. I go, what's that? I go, when we grow cells in a lab, we make something called culture medium. I go, yeah, but what is it? And I go, laboratory version of blood. So I go, ah, so I look at what human blood is made out of and then in the lab synthesize a version called culture medium. But since I am creating the lab, I changed some of the constituents. So I made three different versions of culture medium, slight like chemistry different. I say, so what? In environment A, version A, the cells form muscle. In environment B, a different version of culture medium, the cells form bone. And in the third dish with different culture medium, the cells form fat cells and I go, Oh, wait a minute, all these cells are genetically identical. <laughs> What's controlling muscle, bone, fat? And I go, not the cells. It was the culture medium environment. So I go, oh, wow, it, the, the genes didn't control life. It was the environment that controls life. And then you go, oh, well, that's cells in a plastic Petri dish. And I go, when you look at yourself, you are a skin covered Petri dish. You have 50 trillion cells under your skin and you have the original culture medium blood. And I go, so what's, what's relevant? I said, it doesn't make a difference if the cell is in a plastic dish or the cell is in a skin dish. It's still affected by the environment, which is culture medium, which is laboratory version of blood or the cells in your body dealing with the, chemi the chemistry of your blood. Now, the last step of this, <laughs> so I can uh, have some kind of conversation. <laughs> uh, the last step of this is very simple. The chemistry of your blood is controlled by your brain. I go, yeah, but what does that mean? I say, and here's the most important point. The brain takes the picture in your mind, whatever it is, and translates that into complementary chemistry that it puts into the blood. And then that environment of the blood now adjusts the genetic to fit the picture that was in your mind. So if you open your eyes and you see someone you love, the chemistry of the brain is, oh, you so much beautiful stuff. Vasopressin makes you more attractive. You know, uh, oxytocin binds you, bonds you to that source of love. Uh, you get pleasure chemicals out of there and growth hormone. I say, so why? I said, the chemical, the chemical infusion of blood from love it causes the cells to grow beautifully. That's why people, when they fall in love, they glow. It's like, well, you're healthy. I go, yeah, you're healthy because that blood chemistry environment, culture medium is enhancing your vitality. And I go, but if you see a picture that scares you, a fear picture, you don't release love chemistry. You start to release stress hormones and chemicals that shut off the immune system in a protection mode. I go, well, wait a minute, then the cells are interpreting the chemistry of the blood to adjust themselves, but the chemistry of the blood is a reflection of the mind. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, we are controlling our genetics. The genetics don't control us. We control it with the chemistry that we send. And all of a sudden it says, then the picture in your mind, consciousness is the director of your biology. Change your consciousness 
and your biology will change automatically. And people go, oh, mind over matter. I go, for a hundred years, we've known that in medicine, it's called the placebo effect. <laughs> I give you this pill, it's gonna heal you. I tell you it's the greatest thing from medicine. This is gonna heal you. I give you the pill, you get well, and you go, oh, the pill healed me. And then it's a sugar pill. And I say, then what healed you? And mm -hmm. the answer is your belief in the sugar pill. And everyone goes, yes, positive thinking, placebo effect. And I go, and what you've left out perhaps is the most important part is that negative thinking is equally powerful as positive thinking, but it goes in the opposite direction. While positive thinking enhances life, negative thinking can cause you to die. You can just have the belief you're gonna die and you will die. You can have the belief of any disease and you can get any disease because the mind is gonna translate that belief into the chemistry that manifests what was in the mind. So um, the, then the bottom line is, Genes do not control our lives. Our consciousness controls our lives. And when we change consciousness, we change the character, not just inside of our body, but the behavior that also complements that picture. And all of a sudden, it, bottom line conclusion, we are not victims of our heredity. We are the masters of our biology. But if you don't know this and let your mind run wild, well, then you can create anything. <laughs> and unfortunately, most of the thinking is negative. And this is why it was so important that uh, Deepak come out early in the game and start giving people this information because it was necessary at this time for people to own their power in creating life. Because if you claim you're a victim, the first thing you did is you let go of power. And now you have no control over your life. And uh, Deepak from day one was talking about this nature of this consciousness that's involved. And in, in my work led to the mechanism where that consciousness hits the cell and boom, biology. Mm, so beautiful, Bruce. I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, it does tie in perfectly to the work that Deepak's been doing, whether you look at any of his 91 plus books, you know, Meta Human and uh, Total Meditation being some of the more recent ones, he has been a proponent of it and somebody who's been giving us all access to it long before it was something that was acceptable, you know, <laughs> to be able to talk about. And I was just thinking about this other day, I host a weekly meditation here on Awake. And in one of the shows, we were talking about playlists in our mind. To your point, Bruce, and I know you talk about this in your books as well, Deepak, we all have a playlist or a tape, you know, some of you might not know what a tape is. It's this old thing from the eighties that <laughs> used to play in a tape player, but nowadays we would call it a playlist. And we have this playlist going in our brain. And what science shows us is our conscious mind is only paying attention to 40 bits of information versus the subconscious paying attention to 40 million bits of information. And so Bruce, as you highlight in the book, you know, this is our opportunity to ask ourselves, is this a playlist I'm choosing? Am I consciously choosing these images, these sounds, these thoughts? And Deepak, I really want to acknowledge you for the work that you've done with the Chopra Center and all of your work. You know, I think I was reading in Super Genes about, you know, a study that UC Davis did about telomeres and, you know, just doing the work by meditating regularly, what that does. And it was funny because when we came on, you guys didn't get to see this, but Bruce is like, wow, Deepak, you look younger than ever. And he does because he's aging in reverse because you even told us on prior shows, Deepak, that you are biologically aging in reverse. So Deepak, since we're on the subject of consciousness and cells, can you share a little bit about how meditation and how some of the things that you suggest in your books can be utilized to harness our consciousness and to allow ourselves to shift our internal microbiome and to be in wholeness and health, no matter what is going on, whatever circumstances or situation we might find ourselves in? So before I answer that, I just want to say that uh, when Bruce wrote his book, that the biology of belief. Uh, as soon as it came out, I, I bought it, I read it, and it validated everything that I was looking at. And so uh, I want to thank Bruce for introducing me to epigenetics. And I followed the whole uh, history uh, of the evolution of this knowledge of epigenetics, the connection between mind, brain, body, uh, perception, cognition, 
in short experience between that and what happens in our biology. But as I followed it, and as I just you know heard this beautiful summary that uh, Bruce gave us of the origins of this science, he said pictures in your mind create activities in your brain which affect your biology. All of that is hundred percent true. And uh, he also said uh, that uh, the environment, which means both the external environment and the internal environment, mental environment, they influence the selectively the activity of genes. Some go on, some go off, etc. He also mentioned the research. You mentioned it right now. Our research was with Elizabeth Blackburn, who is a Nobel laureate. And, our results were published in Nature, um, uh, one of the Nature magazines, where we showed a one-week retreat increased telomerase by 40%. Mm -hmm. So the science is there, and what we know today, at least, and Bruce might have better information from me, but this is from Rudy Tanzi, who I work with at Harvard, that less than 5% of disease-related gene yeah. mutations are fully penetrated. So if you have a gene mutation, like say Angelina Jolie had, uh, Baraka gene, at the moment uh, that predicts 100% that uh, she would get breast cancer. So she had, uh, what do you call it? A preventive mastectomy. Now we know that there are other people who are working on uh, CRISPR and gene editing and all of that, which will change the face of these fully penetrant genes, which could be some karmic destiny, I don't know, but I'm not going there. Um, but that's less than 5% of all disease-related gene mutations, probably 3%. The others are influenced by how we think, how we feel, how we imagine, how we experience anything, any experience, it doesn't matter. This experience right now is causing genes in your frontal cortex to get activated. So you and I and uh, Bruce and everybody who's listening, we're all now entangled in our frontal cortex with gene activity. And if somebody's on the internet and I send them a, 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 a hug and a kiss uh, through an emoticon, we can give them a dopamine hit no matter where they are. So uh, that all is settled. Here's the big thing, which you started out with the first question, which I have been struggling with for the last 15, 20 years, but now even more than ever before. And that is, what the heck is going on? You know, because we look at genes and, you know, that's life. That's the beginning of life. You all started, all of us started as what is, you know, the equivalent of a stem cell, a pluripotential stem cell, all of us. And we had 25,000 genes, half from your mother, half from your father. But it was one cell, stem cell, if you want to call it, pluripotential cell. And uh, it divided into two, and then into four, and then into eight. And as Bruce said, at the end of it, 50 trillion cells that you require to make a human baby, 50 trillion, more than all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Now, here's the key. And uh, you know what uh, Bruce said earlier, you change the environment of the blood, you get a liver, you get a kidney, you get an eye, you get something else, but from the same source, okay? The same source, stem cell. So what we're seeing is what biologists call morphogenesis, give rise to form, morphogenesis, generation of form and differentiation. The one becomes the many. It becomes heart, it becomes kidney, it becomes whatever, lymph, lymph cells, brain cells, fingernails, genitalia, that one cell becomes all these. That's called differentiation. The one becomes many. But the mistake is to think that differentiation is separation. Differentiation mm -hmm. is not separation. Okay, the heart cell, the kidney cell, the eye cell, the brain cell, the genital cell, the cell in your fingernails, the cells in your hair follicles come from that same cell. Okay, they're connected to that cell. Moreover, 
uh, Bruce was also mentioning that there's a high turnover of these cells. You know, your uh, these cells are constantly being born and they're constantly dying as well. In fact, if a cell forgets to die, that the terminology for that is apoptosis, programmed cellular death. So a, a, set, a cell that has forgotten the memory of death is a cancer cell. Cancer cell has no idea that it is part of a wholeness of the body. And in reality, right now, every cell, if you have 30 trillion cells or 50 trillion cells, every cell in your body right now instantly knows what the other cells are doing. Not, it doesn't take a microsecond to, for the heart cell to know what the brain cell is doing or what the kidney cell is doing or what the genital cells are doing or what the stomach cells are doing. They all have to function as one process for your body to function. If a cell doesn't function as instant wholeness, instant wholeness, it's lost the game. That's why every five days, stomach cells are recycling. Every one month, um, skin cells are recycling. Every three months, skeletal cells are cycling. What you're looking at is my 2000, what year is it now? 2021 model. And this is better than my 2016 model honestly, at every level, because every cell is new and the old cells are dead. If they didn't die, this couldn't be born. So right here is a very important insight. Birth and death are ceaseless and instant in every microsecond of our existence. Death is not the opposite of life. Death is the continuum of birth and death. Once you get that, then you go deeper. So what's going on? Okay, what's going on? What exactly is a gene? So, you know, I talk to Rudy and talk to people like Bruce and other experts. They all have their definitions of gene. But a gene to me, and Bruce can correct me later uh, as I finish, a gene is like a word that the, spell, the word is spelled out through what we call nucleotides. ATCG is the simple words, adenine, guanine, cytosine. So that's the alphabet of life, only four letters. Genes are words, 25,000 letters. And what's the body? It's a story, okay? And what is the story? It's a recycled story that's been going on for a few 200,000 years, which we call homo sapiens, okay? The human species but then there are genes for every other species. Some of those stories, including the genes for COVID have been going on for 50 million years. The COVID-19 is so-called because it's an RNA, not a DNA, but never mind that. Um, it's called 2019 because it showed up that particular mutation in the year 2019. But COVID has been around for 50 million years. So have all the other genes in, on our planet. If you go under the soil, under the soil in the Amazon, you take out one teaspoon of soil, it has more genetic biodiversity than the entire planet, including the surface. So the gold mine of life is in that teaspoon of soil under the soil, under the surface of the Amazon. It has in it entangled genetic information of the entire planet, fungi, bacteria, trees, you, me, monkeys, rabbits, octopuses, name it, right there is the genetic information. And it's entangled. Entangled means each gene is part of an ecosystem of, or ecology um, that exists of life. So what is a gene? And here's where the non-dualists come in and where Bruce and I actually are going is I think genes are symbolic representations of conscious agents mm. that form the matrix of existence of all sentient beings on this planet. All sentient beings. By that, I mean viruses, bacteria, fungi, trees, plants, um, reptiles, uh, mammals, primates, chimpanzees, gorillas, humans. 
that that genetic information is the symbolic representation of conscious agents in a matrix of conscious agents, which are differentiated from one consciousness, which we call pure consciousness. Now, if you were religious, you would call it God or the divine, or you'd call it non-local, a-causal, quantum mechanical, interrelatedness. You could call it anything, ein sof, Allah, it doesn't matter. But there is one consciousness, which is differentiating, not separating, differentiating into conscious agents of which human beings are one conscious agents. The genes are their symbolic representation and everything after that is a symbolic representation of that conscious agent. Everything, your body, your eyes, your things, your perceptions, your cognition, your thinking, the biosphere, the Milky Way galaxy, all is possible because of consciousness. So what is consciousness? It is that which makes any experience possible, mental, perceptual, um, emotional, it doesn't matter. Imagination, it doesn't matter. So in the Vedic tradition, some aspects of the Vedic tradition, you know, in the West, they have these words, fundamental reality, perceptual reality. The other day I was interviewing a Nobel laureate, you will check. He said, fundamental reality is spin, charge, and mass. I said, do spin, charge, and mass have structure? He said, no. I said, do they have any dimensionality? He said, no. I said, what are they? He said, they are entities where these activities reside, spin charge and mass. You know, it sounded almost like um, the, uh, the uh, in the Sanskrit, we use this word. Uh, um, the, the word is uh, sattva, rajas, tamas. These are impulses of intelligence that weave the matrix of existence. And the word is tantra, tantra. Tantra literally means a web of conscious agents expressing as the universe. So what is consciousness? It's the fundamental ground of the total universe. What is everything else? A symbolic representation of it. What is meditation ultimately? To get to non-symbolic uh, experience. So non-symbolic experience means consciousness without its fluctuations, which are called vrittis in Sanskrit. So a thought is a vritti. An emotion is a vritti, a perception is a vritti, a qualia is a vritti, an opinion about the qualia is a vritti, a belief is a vritti. So all there is is Shiva, pure consciousness, and Shakti, which is the divine feminine in these traditions, which are vrittis. So Shiva as pure consciousness is infinite possibilities, infinite correlation, infinite differentiation, infinite love, infinite creativity, infinite evolution, and the entire ecosystem is actually an ecosystem of conscious agents. They're not visible. You can't see them because they are the ones that are doing the seeing, okay? Conscious agents are invisible. They are formless. They're infinite. They are irreducible, they are without cause, no cause effect. And without them, there's no life, no existence. Even the biosphere that we call the biosphere, we call it the environment, right? But we've said the rivers and waters are our circulation. The earth is our recycling as our body. The air is our breath, the Milky Way galaxy give 50% of the atoms in your body right now. Other 50% come from other galaxies as a result of gravitational wind. So who are you right now? You are the entire universe epigenetically modifying itself into what we call Jennifer or Deepak or Bruce, but they are all symbols. There's no reality to them, period. How do we know that? By the time we finish this conversation, you will have a different body, a different mind, a different personality, probably, hopefully, different emo emotions and different imagination, because every impulse of intelligence, every bit of information, every thought, every memory, every wisp of imagination appears as this. But this is a symbolic signature. By the time I take a photo of you, it doesn't exist. It's gone. 
Okay, so, so what did you get? Deepak, so much to go there. I, my question that I wanna tie in now for Bruce on what you just said is you basically suggested or asserted that the universe, everything, including genes, including everything out there that makes up the universe are these conscious agents that are part of a larger whole. So my question to you, Bruce, and I know you address this quite thoroughly in the biology of belief is if everything is conscious agents and if people out there are suffering right now, people do have cancer, people do have different diseases. I wanna make this applicable for our audience, our listeners, our viewers, Okay, we talked scientifically, philosophically, let's talk real. How do we then harness these conscious agents? What would stop me just like with somebody in multiple personality disorder or dis, uh, I believe it's called dissociative identity disorder. And in one personality, they're allergic to orange juice. In another, they're not. In one personality, they have blue eyes and another, their eyes are brown. Let's talk about that for a minute, Bruce. How do we actually give people the ability to pluck that conscious agent that is cancer out of their body and throw it away and be like, okay, well, I don't have a need for this. How do we begin to harness that? Well, uh, the first step for me was when I understood the nature, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the nature of how the cell works. Uh, the cells have genes, we've been talking about them and I'll give another vision that uh, goes along with what Deepak just said, but consider it this way. Uh, a gene is a blueprint to make a protein and a protein is a building block of the body. There are 100,000 different proteins uh, uh, and they assemble in different ways. Muscle cell has one assembly of proteins, a brain cell has a different assembly of proteins, et cetera. Proteins then come from genes. And I say, well, genes are blueprints. And I go, they absolutely are. <laughs> and then I go, so why is it relevant? And I say, a blueprint cannot turn itself on and off. That's the most important thing we have to understand right here. And I go, what do you mean? I say, you can read a blueprint. You go into an architect's office, she's working on a blueprint and you ask her, is your blueprint on or off? And she look at you, like, you're crazy, it's a blueprint, there's no on and off. And I go, exactly. That a blueprint can be read or not read. Ah, then I go then, well, who or what is the reader of these blueprints? And I go, the mind reads and the mind edits the blueprints. I say edit, I go, yeah, here's the conundrum that science found when they wanted to do the human genome project. There are 100,000 different proteins, fact, that it takes a gene <clears throat> to make a protein. So before the program got off the ground, they were saying, oh, it's gonna be over 100,000 human genes. It turns out there, as Deepak mentioned, there's 20, approximately 20, 22,000 genes to make 100,000 proteins, all of a sudden it's like, that doesn't make any sense. Now we know that consciousness can edit like an architect, any of the blueprints. You can make 3000 different proteins from the same gene blueprint. That in our genes, only 3% of the gene at most of the genes that we have only 3% make up a human. Hmm. I go, wow, I go, oh, what about the other 97%? Well, they call that junk DNA, but that's stupid. <laughs> Uh, that's stupid because we tried to compare cells to humans. Now, humans might be inefficient, but cells are pretty damn efficient. <laughs> and so what is that 97%? Well, here's another number that's freaky. Between 5 and 8% of the genes are making viruses. Ah, <clears throat> we make our own viruses. They're called exosomes. And I go, because it's the highest form of communication because you, a virus has a zip code and a virus could, uh, I got 50 trillion cells, but the virus's zip code can say, I want to go to that cell, not the other cells, or I want to go to that cell. And all of a sudden you say, oh, wow, it's like a delivery system of information. We got uh, quadrillion <laughs> exosomes in our blood sending information all over the place. Okay. Yeah. I say, but who is the architect? I said, the mind is the architect. And then, and I wanna extend on Deepak's point for a moment because, well, just blanket statement, quantum physics, the most valid science on the planet, there's no science that has been tested or affirmed to be truer, says in reality, when you go to the bottom of that atom, what is it made out of? And it's made out of invisible forces. I go, so why is it relevant? I said, everything is made out of invisible energy. And I say, we are creating this illusion out of the energy with our mind. So I go, oh, okay, so the mind's doing this. But 
right now, uh, Deepak's got his mind. Jennifer, you have yours. I have mine. And I go, what makes us different? And this is the part that blew my mind because I wasn't spiritual. I was a guy with proteins and genes and cells and doing all that. Uh, but I realized at the moment that the genes are a uh, nucleus where the genes are. In the textbook, they call it the brain. You can take the nucleus out and the cells live for months. So a brain, if you take it out of an organism, the organism is going to die. Obviously, the nucleus is not the brain. It's the skin of the cell. <clears throat> a parallel. Human embryology, the brain and nervous system come from the skin of the embryo. So like the cell, we're uh, an image of that. And I go, so why is it relevant? Because the first thing I understood is this, no two people are biologically the same. I go, what do you mean? I say, I cannot put my cells into your body or Deepak's body without your immune system saying not self and reject it. I go, wait a minute. Each of us has a unique self that other person's immune system would say, that's not me. And the immune system will, and I go, where, where is the self? And I started to recognize on the surface of our cells there are, are protein, they're like antennas. And there's a group of them called, interestingly, self receptors. Mm. Now they were misnamed, but it's actually the appropriate name, but they were misnamed originally because they were stuck in the physical world that the physical proteins here are what make a cell. And I go, no, they're called receptors. They're receivers. And I go, if I cut off your self receptors, your cells have no identity. I, <clears throat> I can transplant them in anybody. They will never be rejected because there's no personal identity. And I go, so my personal identity, your personal identity is due to each of us having a set of these antennas, like a, a frequency thing, like a station out of the broadcast field of all. So uh, that was all that is. Uh, Deepak mentioned God, whatever you want to call it, all that is. Uh, the analogy is like uh, uh, in old fashioned radios where you had a dial where you could move the dial across and get different stations. So I say, let's say the AM band could have lots of, could have a thousand stations in there. But as you move the dial across, you pick up one station, you pick up another station because they're a slight different frequency. And I go, each of us is like a station in the same broadcast. Mm -hmm. Each of us is receiving a broadcast, but no two people receive the same broadcast because no two people have the same set. <clears throat> and I go, so why is it relevant? Analogy, that's really cool. My body is a television set. It's receiving a broadcast over my self receptors. Now, every one of you is receiving your own broadcast because each one of you has a unique set, like a, a combination lock. And I go, so why is it relevant? I go, the broadcast is personal identity. And I go, so yeah, so what? And I go, I'm the only one that receives the Bruce show, Jennifer receiving Jennifer show. And I go, so what? I say, you're watching a TV and the TV breaks. You say, oh, TV's dead. I go, yeah. The most important question though is the TV has died, but is the broadcast still there? And the answer, of course, the broadcast is still there. It's an energy field. <laughs> I say, how would you know? I said, well, you can get another TV and plug it in and turn it on and tune it to the station. Boom, it's back on air. I go, oh, my God. I couldn't die. I can't die. I'm not even in here. I'm the broadcast. You're looking at the television set. <laughs> and I go, so what? If I die, a future embryo will have the same set of antennas that I have now. I'm back. Different TV. Does it make a difference, male or female? No, that's TV. Does it make a difference, white, brown, black, red, yellow? No, no, that's the TV. We are all the broadcasts. And, and then to, uh, my curious mind <clears throat> at that moment of saying, oh my God, I have a, a field, an energy, a spirit. A, a field in, in, in physics is invisible moving forces that influence the physical world. I go, spirit invisible moving forces that influence the physical world, spirit and field. So quantum physics and spirituality, same thing. And I go, so why would the, the, the most important joy moment came when I asked myself as a science guy, well, if I have a spirit, then why have a body? Why not just be a spirit? 
50 trillion cells in my body welled up with the answer. And they turned out to be Jewish comedian cells. And I said, what do you mean? I said, I asked the question, why have both? And the cells answered with a question, Bruce, if you're just a spirit, what does chocolate taste like? Mm. And all of a sudden I said, oh my God, this is a virtual reality suit. I can see, I can smell, I can feel, I can touch. I have emotions. I get, this is a translation of an energy field by 50 trillion cells that translated into a vibration that my brain receives and my brain broadcasts back. How do I know? Well, EEG, I can read your brain inside because I put wires on your head and electrical conduction of the brain, I can read it. But instead of electroencephalograph, there's something called magnetoencephalograph. I go, magnetoencephalograph, MEG. I say, what's relevant? It reads your brain just like EEG. And I go, yeah, but what about it? The probe is out here. And I go, if you stop for just one second and say, what the heck does that mean? I say, your consciousness is not contained in your head. You are broadcasting it. And I go, well, then what happens when large numbers of people broadcast the same consciousness? And I say, that's reality. And when a broad number of people change that consciousness collectively, we change reality. And this is what we're being called upon at this time in the evolution of human civilization because human behavior is responsible for precipitating what is called the sixth mass extinction of life. Point, well, there were five previous mass extinctions. And I go, <clears throat> what does that mean? I said, some cataclysmic event happens on earth and wipes out up to 90% of life and it starts over again. The last time, the last mass extinction, 66 million years ago, planet was lush with jungles and forests and dinosaurs. And a comet hit near Mexico, upended the web of life, the dinosaurs disappeared, the forests disappeared, essentially started all over again. And here we are today, 66 million years later. And now science has recognized a fact that we are in the sixth mass extinction, not that we're flirting with it, we're losing species of organisms faster than in previous mass extinctions. Problem, it's human behavior that is precipitating this. And I go, why is it relevant? We, in our consciousness, the way we've been using it has been collectively destroying the environment which provides for us. If the environment gets destroyed, we can't be here either. So we're in the sixth mass extinction. And I go, yes, you look around the world, it's chaos and falling apart. And I say, you cannot build the sustainable world that we want on the foundation of the consciousness that we have had, because it's the consciousness that has created the, the, the extinction. So to build a sustainable world, what you're seeing is a collapsing of the structure. Yeah, and I'm saying, this is very positive. Most people are afraid, ah, it's falling down. I go, no, don't worry, because if it doesn't fall down, we're in worse situation. And so the falling down means what? The opportunity to build up a new one. I say, well, what are we going to predicate this new one on? I go, Deepak's been talking about this for, what, 20 some years now. I've been talking about it over 20 years. I say, we have an understanding, but it's the first time now that people have to wake up and say, that old belief system where we bought into other people to make us architects, we are creating our life. Yeah, but not with your consciousness, you're creating with the consciousness you've been programmed with. And I go, that's the consciousness that's destructive. This is now the time to recognize you are an independent agent, that you are not powerless. You are the most powerful creator of your life that ever existed. You are creating this. And I go, and this is where people, they sort of shy away. I say, you create the good and you also create the bad. And so rather than blaming that, those, that, who they did, it's the wake up call that says, no, you want your power back? You have to get back in the conscious driver's seat because we've been running off of programs. 95% of our life is programmed. Uh, and this, I, you know, I wanna give Deepak a shot here, but I I'll just finish this program section right here for why. I say the brain is a computer. We all know that is the most magnificent computer humans have ever experienced. And I go, so why is it relevant? Well, first of all, it's a computer. I say, so relevant. You go to the store, you buy a brand new computer, you take it home, you plug it in, you push start, it boots up. And I go, great. Now I say, do something, write an essay, make a you know spreadsheet, make a drawing. You say, can't do it. I say, why not? 
you got to put programs in before mm. you can use the computer. So I say, a child has to have programs. What, to be a member of a family, a member of a community? I say, where does it get the programs from? It's an infant. And I tell you the truth here, and the Jesuits have said it for 400 years, same truth. And that is that for the first seven years of your life, your brain is not in the conscious activity as predominant. It's in a little lower called theta, which is imagination. That's how you can have a tea party, pour nothing into the cup, drink it and go, that was the best tea I ever had in my life. And I go, that's theta, but theta is hypnosis. And I go, why is it relevant? How do you think you got the programs to be a member of a family and a community? Seven years, you observed your mother, your father, your community, and you, like a video recorder, downloaded the behavior as programs. So the fundamental programs in your nervous system didn't even come from you. They came from other people. Good programs, bad programs, up to 70% are actually disempowering programs. And I go, so what? And I say, after age seven, consciousness kicks in. Now you're the one who can type on the keyboard and change the program. And I go, yeah, but then here's the problem. Consciousness can observe the world and consciousness can think. I go, there's two profound differences. Observing the world, the consciousness is watching. Thinking, consciousness goes inside. If I say, Jennifer, what are you doing uh, on Thursday? And it's not in front of you right now, but in a moment of thinking, you could say, oh, on Thursday, I'm going to do this. And I go, where'd you get that? I said, oh, you went inside your head. I said, then you stop looking outside the window because a consciousness was inside. And then comes the final thing. Then how much of the time are we spending thinking for this reason? Because the more thinking you're doing, the less the consciousness is engaged because it's inside thinking. And it turns out you're only conscious 5% of the day. And I go, then what does that mean the rest of the day? If I'm driving the car and I'm thinking and I'm not looking out, who's driving the car? I go, subconscious is autopilot. I go, so why is it relevant? You're only creating 5% of your life. 95% of your life is coming out from a program that you got from other people, most of them disempowering. And if you can take that consciousness back into your life, then you become the creator. And so a, powerful, Bruce. That is so incredibly powerful. And I want to give Deepak a moment here to respond. Yes. To wrap up, because we could obviously, between the two of you guys, we could just geek out. We got here. hours in front of us. <laughs> so what, what, what Bruce said is brilliant, um, absolutely brilliant, and uh, all the metaphors that he used are absolutely correct. I just have to add one more comment, and I think Bruce will agree with that, is that everything we speak of is a metaphor to begin with. Um, uh, the world is a metaphor, uh, so is the mind and their symbolic representations of consciousness. The goal in Eastern wisdom traditions is to recognize that you're not even the mind. So right now, Jennifer, just do an experiment. Think of the Empire State Building. Do you see a picture? Totally. Uh, do you think of a beautiful sunset on the ocean, red sunset of the ocean? Do you see a picture? Absolutely. Think of someone you love. Do you see their face? Yes. Think of the feeling they evoke in you and experience that. Do you feel the feeling that we call love right now? Always. Whoever you're thinking of, can you hear their voice? Definitely. If you've been intimate with them, can you feel the texture of their skin? <laughs> yes. And you right now smell it? Yes. How do you do that? I'm just saying this and, you know, I say Empire State Building, you see an Empire State Building. I say this, you do that. How do you do that? And what is it that does it? What does it is consciousness. It's not the mind. The activity mm -hmm. is the mind, which then projects itself, ego, intellect, and physical body and the experience of the world. So who's in charge? Bruce said, you are in charge. But the you that is in charge is not even the mind. It's the one that's in charge of the mind because the experience of the mind tells you that the awareness of the mind is obviously not the mind. The awareness of any experience, mental, perceptual, is not that experience. So 
that consciousness which knows the mind is intrinsically free of the mind. That consciousness that knows the world as a perceptual modification of itself is also intrinsically free of that world because it is consciousness that conceived, constructed, governed, and became that experience. This is the ultimate value of what we call metacognition, to be aware of the mind, perception, and realize that one is not out there and one is not in here. There are fluctuations of something that is infinite, inconceivable, borderless, formless. So anything that you, if you can see it, touch it, taste it, smell it, conceptualize it, imagine it, think about it, it's not real. It's what Bruce is calling the VR program. And we've been all programmed and in Eastern wisdom traditions that programming is called karma. Once you override the karma and you reinterpret what Bruce is saying, there's no such thing as karma, it's just freedom to create whatever reality you want. So everything that you call real is subject to revision. Now, the Germans have two words for reality, realitat or the other is called wirklichkeit or something like that. So one is perceived reality, one is real reality. In Sanskrit, we don't use those words sometimes reality, perceive, real, mental, perceptual, one word, existence. And what exists, anything that appears on the screen of consciousness exists, whether it's a thought, it's a perception, it's imagination, it's all one thing and it's not a thing, it's you. Okay, mic drop, Deepak, I don't have much after that. Yeah, I have a suggestion for the title because I have to go sometime. Don't worry. I know. I promise I, I broke my word. By the way, if Bruce agrees, conscious agents are souls, okay? They're jivas. Mm -hmm. So when we say conscious agent, that unique conscious agent that is projecting right now as the signature that we see as a body mind called Jennifer or Deepak, that's a soul. That's a conscious agent. And it's timeless, eternal, not subject to birth or death. So I would like to suggest that title, Conscious Agents, Souls, and the Matrix of Existence. But Ooh. let, let, let uh, Bruce <laughs> approve or disapprove. You get the veto power, Bruce. <laughs> no veto power, no veto power on this for the reason is uh, Deepak is absolutely 100%. I'm agreeing with this. What's on the screen? Uh, is the visual reality of an energy behind it. Remember, the screen is driven by an invisible energy force behind it. Uh, and you can talk about the screen or you can talk about the energy that's coming behind it, okay? Uh, uh, and the beautiful part about all this is if we understand the nature of what Deepak has talked about, we have a reality that we're manifesting, but we have a consciousness that's different. And I go, the movie The Matrix, which most people have seen, uh, when I bring it up in the lecture, I say, it's not science fiction, it's a documentary. Everyone has already been programmed. And I say, yeah, we're all operating from a program. And in the movie, they had something, you could take a red pill and get out of the program. And I go, interesting fact, most people uh, after at least teenage years in the 20s and other, have taken that red pill with the most amazing consequences without even knowing that was what happened. And that is when people fall in love, their life could be blah, 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 blah. And then one day they meet this person. And by the end of the day, it's like, oh, and then I say, what happens next? There's a period the, and that's variable called the honeymoon. I go, what's the honeymoon? I go, it was blah, 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 blah. And then the honeymoon, it was like heaven on earth. I go, what do you mean? You, your whole life was blah. And then in 24 hours, you, you did heaven on earth. You created heaven. It wasn't, it was always there. You just now created it in that sense of being in it. And I go, so why is it relevant? And the relevant was this, what was the difference from blah, blah, blah to heaven? And the answer was 95% of your life was coming from the program, blah, 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 blah. The red pill falling in love is for the first time, instead of being 5% running from consciousness, which is wishes and desires, 
It becomes 90% of your life is coming from the wishes and desires. You're not playing the programs. And the first time you stop playing the program, you created wishes and desires. And the whole idea is the difference between hell and heaven on earth is a damn program. <laughs> because when you let go of the program, then the heaven showed up. Uh, and I'm sure uh, uh, Deepak can give us the spiritual philosophy behind it, but that's a mechanism that uh, people have experienced personally. How did your life change in 24 hours? The answer was, you just stopped playing that program. And unfortunately, thinking, which is where the program got set off, you start thinking and then you go into the old program, Inevitably, it has to come back because we have jobs, we have responsibilities, we have chores, we've got to start thinking. And the moment thinking comes back in, guess what? You start playing those programs with all the defects in it. And I go, what do you think your partner is experiencing? First, they experience you from the wishes and desires of the beautiful conscious mind. And all of a sudden, these programs show up and they go, who are you? Where did that behavior come from? And it was because you started playing those programs you never played when you in the honeymoon. And those right. are the programs that run your life. And your partner looks at you like two different people just happened here. Uh, uh, <laughs> so uh, really that's important. why we need to check out your book, The Honeymoon Effect. <laughs> the Honeymoon, uh, 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 and, uh, and it's an experience. And I go, why? Because most people for the first time created from something they wanted rather than playing a program they were uh, programmed to carry out, they stopped the program. And I say, right. what if everybody stopped playing the damn program? And I go, then heaven on earth is not, not a coincidence. Heaven on earth would be our reality because the program is taking us away from that, which leads me as A, non-spiritual, B, oh, the little antennas, spiritual, C, was the choice of said, why have the body? And it says, it enhances my spirituality. It's creative. And then all of a sudden I go, the last point was, Oh my God, you don't, in my perception, you don't die and go to heaven. You came here to create. And heaven is when you let go of the program, you manifested it. And all of a sudden I say, stop living only to die that you could go to heaven and start recognizing you can create that experience on this planet right now. And, and, um, and it's more fun to do it when you have a body because it's the body that translates love chemistry into what? Sensation. And all of a That's sudden, true, I can, true. yeah. That's I, really incredible. I and I, I promised I'm gonna get in deep trouble. Speaking of the thinking, it's coming in because I promised to Deepak that we would allow him to gracefully exit by the top of the hour. Yeah, so I Deepak just want to conclude with what uh, Bruce said. The great Indian uh, poet Tagore said, love is not a mere sentiment. It's the ultimate truth at the heart of creation. It's unity consciousness. So falling in love is a spiritual experience, but over the years, what I've realized is you don't fall in love with a person. You fall in love with consciousness. Mm. Beautifully put. Thank you so much, Deepak, Bruce. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you for taking the time to be here with us, to everybody who tuned in, Thank wherever. You, Bruce. More to come. Let's connect again. I, I so appreciate it. It's been a number of years, and we've been on a very busy track, and they need us now more than ever, because what you've been saying, what my science I've been offering, is freedom, and that's what we need. That's Thank what you. we need, freedom. Thank you, Bruce.